Jane C. Patterson and Megan Walker are hybrid authors who have hit their stride as a co-writing team. Despite early successes, they were each feeling stuck in their writing journeys before they connected. They decided to collaborate in a way that played to their strengths. Megan's superpower is the first draft, while Jancy's is revision. It clearly worked because together they've co-produced 15 romance and epic fantasy novels and they're still going. For their fantasy series, they have a third collaborator and publish under the pen name Kara Witter. To learn more about their unique writing journeys, their successes and struggles, and collaborative process, be sure to listen to today's episode of the Fearless Storyteller podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Fearless Storyteller podcast. I'm your host, Ethan Freckleton. Have you ever noticed how fear stops us from creating and sharing our best work? Join the Fearless Storyteller as we explore the heart and soul of writing stories, songs, and scripts that sell with the people who write them. Each guest has their own unique hero's journey and insights into the intersections between limiting beliefs and success. If you're enjoying this podcast, be sure to leave a review on your favorite podcatcher of choice. Also, be sure to check out the show notes for a link to the Patreon offerings. I've got some good ones for you. Thanks so much for being a listener and supporter of the show. Enjoy today's interview. Megan Walker and Jancy Patterson, welcome to the Fearless Storyteller. Thank Thank you. you. Thanks for having us on. Yeah, and this is this is one of those rare interviews where I have two authors at the same time, and this time you're both in the same room, <laughs> which, which is you know it's it's a crazy thing to consider in in the 2020 apocalypse that is writer right. life. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Probably writer life in general. We're such you yeah. know isolated beings, but with as many books as Jancy and I write together, it really helps that we live like 20 minutes apart. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so for people so for people who don't know who you are, maybe you can each share a little bit about yourself, whatever you want. Well, so I'll start with us together. We are a writing team. We do mm-hmm. um contemporary romance, uh, rom-coms, and also young adult urban fantasy. And also with uh, Lauren Janice, we also write epic fantasy under the pen name Kara Witter. Okay. Um, so then I also have some contemporary young adult novels out. I just finished co-writing the final book in Brandon Sanderson's Alcatraz versus the Evil Librarian series. Um, I'm going to be doing some more books with Brandon coming up that I'm really excited about. Cool. Um, so that's me. And yeah, and that's Megan, right? That was, that was dancing. Sorry. Okay, we're going to have to identify ourselves when we speak for a little bit. <laughs> Okay, so yes, that was Jancy. So Megan, um, so she talked about us uh, writing together. Um, I pretty much got my start in writing um, fantasy short stories. Mm. Um, So I've written um, like a bunch of ones that were published um, by some various places, uh, Fireside Magazine, uh, one of the bigger ones. Um, Probably the one that's most well-known, if anything's well-known, is I wrote the story called Tuesdays with Malakesh the Destroyer. Okay. Um, that got some traction at the time. It's a really good story. You should go read it. Ha. <laughs> it's and got so a really have... fun title. I'm, I'm, I'm in. Awesome. And it's still up for free on Fireside, right? Can you still get it? Yeah, you can still get it up for free on Fireside. Yeah. And then I also have an anthology, um, basically, that I published of um, my various uh, published short stories. It's actually called Tuesdays with Malkes the Destroyer and other tales um, that's up on Amazon. They, these were all written under uh, my name before Megan Gray. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so then that was pretty much what I was doing before then. And I had written a couple books, but had not published them or anything. And then met Jancy and we started working together and like the rest is history. And Megan actually started all the series that we're working on someday, perhaps we will write ones that we came up with together, but she had written the first books of all three. Yeah. I guess all three of the series yeah, three that we've series. done, I sort of mm-hmm. came in, the first book was written we did a big overhaul in the first book, you know, all three of the series yes. and then went forward from there. Jancy's superpower, I believe. I mean, she has many superpowers. One of her major superpowers is uh, the revision skill, which I am. I do a lot of structural revision, like take it apart, break all the bones, reset them. Uh That's sort of my thing. 
Wow, that I, sounds, I that sounds like draft. almost painful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I find the first draft painful. Like when there's something to work with, now I've really got my groove. When I've just got nothing, then it's like the slog to get something to work with. Well, me. did you know this before you started working together, though? That piece, yeah. Yeah, I figured that out through lots of painful struggle by myself. <laughs> Yeah, so well, how and did... the way we found out to working together yeah. was that like when we met, so I had these drafts of these books um, and they were, they were like, you know, getting like, you know, requests from agents and stuff like that, but I wasn't getting agents and I wasn't getting, you know, I just mm -hmm. wasn't getting past that thing. And I knew there was things mm -hmm. like structurally wrong with them and I didn't know how to fix them. Mm -hmm. And so when Jancy and I first became friends, I knew this was something she was really good at. Um, so she was the one I had talked to many people giving me advice, but when I talked to her and she was like, Oh no, what you need is this and this, this is what's wrong with it. And I was like, Oh my gosh, you have solved <laughs> years worth of mystery here. Um, and then eventually our friendship, we just became such good friends. That, um, we just started talking about doing these together. What happened mm -hmm. was we, uh, with the, the epic fantasy with our other friend, Lauren, we were all sitting together and they, I had been hearing about these books for like a year and a half and how much they loved them and how it was just so broken and they were never going to fix them. And we were sitting at lunch and there was just this moment where I was like, you know, I can revise. And we all just kind of <laughs> looked at each other like, Oh, <laughs> and sort of then like the partnership was born. Yep. Uh, it was just like, like one of those moments was there like a yeah. sound effect in the background oh yeah it was, it was. there were like light bulbs fireworks oh, chorus yeah like it was <laughs> and, and the nice thing is like really our strengths and weaknesses are incredibly complementary mm -hmm. you don't always find that like with co-authors but it yeah. makes it like really a great system which is why then like we just kept like yeah. oh let's write this series let's do this one mm -hmm. let's <laughs> yep yeah and so it sounds like you're really into writing like you must be to yeah. like and so how did you come like each of you come to want to write or decide to write hmm. okay want to write um okay so this is megan <laughs> i don't know how long we have to identify ourselves um <laughs> but uh i mean i was like I was one of those like little kids that just wrote stories all the time and just wrote, you know, um, and I got really into epic fantasy when I picked up Lord of the Rings and I was like mm. around like my daughter's age around 12 or 13. Um, and then I just wanted to write epic fantasy, epic fantasy. And so I just wrote a ton of the beginnings of books that went nowhere mm -hmm. um, and made up about a ton of worlds that also went nowhere. And then um, when I was actually 17, I wrote a chapter that actually appears in our epic fantasy series it yeah. is very different and much better done than when i was 17 but you can tell reading it it's the same chapter so that's kind of fun mm. <laughs> and i am much older than 17 right now <laughs> um so so yeah so i don't i just always did that but I, to me it never really became um serious i mean i was doing it and i wanted to but i just didn't know that i was going to actually really um try to make a career out of it um until i was um 30 and I decided that was 10 years ago for people keeping track. Um, and I decided to write, um, I was going to write a book. I was going to finish a book. Um, and I did that with the YA urban fantasy that we have coming out. And that was my first, first finished novel. And then from there, it was like, I can do this thing now. Yeah. Once I did that, you know. For me, yeah. this is Jancy. I was uh, a freshman in college and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to major in. I had a whole long list of things that I might want to major in and English and writing were not on the list. And so I was just taking classes. I was working on my general ed stuff and just taking other classes to see. And I kept crossing stuff off the list. And meanwhile, I was going to UC Santa Cruz, which mm -hmm. I love. I love UC Santa Cruz. It's amazing. But it is definitely a party school. <laughs> and I don't drink. So I was bored a lot. And in my spare time, I started writing this novel um, just for fun. And I had a friend who was actually going to a different college, a friend from high school who was reading the chapters as I wrote them. And we would like, I am back and forth this is back when uh, instant messenger was a thing and like a separate program. Cause I'm ancient. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> she, she was reading it. And so I think I finished it for her because it was so fun to have somebody reading the thing that I wrote and I finished and I had crossed every single major off of my list and I decided what I wanted to do was write. And that mm. was kind of like it for me. That was 20 years ago. And I kind of started pursuing writing as a career from sort of then on. Um, I've never really done anything else. I haven't had enough success for that to be <laughs> like a reasonable thing, but I'm a little bit uh, stubborn. And yeah. so when I have, I've failed at virtually everything at this point, we're actually, we're doing pretty well now, but for a long time, I would just, I would just try something and then I would get rejected, get rejected, get rejected, finally sold a book, it flopped. 
um, on and on and on and on and on. And I just kept at it because that's who I am. Yeah. Which is really, I think, one of the keys to like yeah. this. I mean, yeah. Be insane. Be, yeah. Yeah. Actually, that's probably it. But yeah. the stubbornness really, yeah. like, I think mm-hmm. that's the, that's, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people talk about that, but it is, it's true. That's why people say it. You, yeah. you know, you're going to get rejected a million times. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> setback after setback after setback. Yeah. Uh-huh. And I imagine there's different reasons to get rejected and it may not be clear oh, yeah. early on why. Oh, yeah. Yeah which could be, you know, <laughs> a reason to just assume that you're not good at it or, you know, mm-hmm. I don't know. How, so how did you like, like, did you come up with like co- coping mechanisms or do some work to figure out like why maybe these were getting rejected to go along with continuing to write? For sure. Um, I, one of the big tools for me, especially early on was I was in a critique group. Mm-hmm. Um, I did essentially like the the membership of the critique group changed, but I did a weekly critique group for like 15 years um, every week, just submitting stuff. And that helped Mm -hmm. immensely. Um, I've been working with my agent for about 10 years and he helped a lot too. Mm -hmm. And really though, um, at this point in my career, I feel like when you're early on, it's because you don't have the tools and your stuff isn't, mm-hmm. it's not that you're not good enough. I hate that. It's like this like value judgment on yourself. Right. Yeah. And it's not that it's that your work is not, you don't have all the skills yet. Your work mm-hmm. is not polished enough yet. And then you get to a point where you discover that everybody continues to get rejected for the rest of their career. What? <laughs> um, <laughs> so what? <laughs> Like I talked about working with Brandon, Brandon Sanderson. He's a good friend of mine. He gets rejected. People don't know this, right? But he does. Everybody gets rejected forever and it never stops. <laughs> um, you can just generate at that point, you have more successes. You can win. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but like the dealing with rejection is something you have to learn to deal with early on. I think that's helpful, right? Like, and like, just imagine anybody that you look up to and think, this person gets rejected. Yeah, everybody yeah. does. And I think everyone, like I used to take it so personally, and I'm not going to say I still don't yeah. <laughs> take it personally because it's really hard not to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but one thing, it happens enough times that eventually yeah. you just sort of get used to it. Um, another thing is like you really do have to, I don't know how different people do it, but you really do have to learn how to like separate, again, your self-worth Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. from something a random agent or a publisher or person in your writing group um or whatever happens to say you know about your about your Mm. work and also at the same time being willing to listen to them Mm. and like take what nuggets of you know value there is from the things they're saying yeah Yeah. i think that really hits it it's like this balance because you don't want to be the person who never listens to anyone and therefore they never get better because they can't ever take criticism and see their work in a new light and change it but you also don't want to be the person who changes everything to please everyone all the time and you have no grounding in your own Mm. work or your own writing or what you want i know a lot of people on both sides but i feel like the way to succeed is right down the middle Mm -hmm. yeah Mm. And are there different types of feedback like the, oh, yeah. that may be more meaningful to you now than than others? My rule is I don't listen to anyone who does not like what I'm writing. Mm. Um, if they don't like it, why am I trying to please them? This isn't something they would read anyway. I'm just they're they're going to be trying to steer me towards some genre or tone or whatever that they want. Yeah. And so I listen very carefully to people who are like, I love what you're doing, but I have these problems. Yeah. And one of the advantages of something like a writing group or whatever, um, or like, for instance, like, again, when I was shopping around the YA urban fantasy, um, is I kept hearing from various people, it was phrased in different ways, but I kept hearing essentially the same thing. Mm -hmm. It was just phrased in different ways. So at first it was kind of hard to to lock down, but then eventually I realized, especially talking to Jancy, that it was a structure problem. Mm -hmm. Um, And so really, there was some detective work that was involved in that, Mm -hmm. right? It was like, at first I was like, oh, the first few chapters aren't really working. So I just kept putting Band-Aid fixes on those, on those. And then like, eventually I realized that it wasn't actually them. It was was the structure problem that was coming up later. that was causing people to stop at a certain point. Um, yeah, that's, that's really insightful. The, the readers will not tell you what's wrong. They will tell you what they think is wrong, mm-hmm. but usually that's not the problem. And it gets so frustrating when somebody tells you exactly what they think is wrong and you fix it and it doesn't fix anything. Yeah. You're like, but you said, why aren't you happy now? And it's because they don't know. They're not the writer. They don't know how to fix it. They're 
almost always right that there's a problem there, though. Yeah, that's true. And it true. gets really frustrating sorting mm. through and trying to figure out what the problem actually is. It sounds like when you're watching a show, right, and you're like, this isn't working for me. Yeah. <laughs> And right yeah like maybe my wife's watch my wife's watching with me and you know <laughs> if i call out some story structural thing i might get kicked in the pants but <laughs> <laughs> she's like i just want to enjoy this <laughs> exactly <laughs> at my house we enjoy things by ripping them to shreds that's how we enjoy them <laughs> it's hard to do that with netflix <laughs> literally yeah, yeah. perhaps <laughs> If you just buy enough used books for a dollar or so, you have plenty of material. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So like structural things, you know, in terms of feedback, you know, I imagine there's different like levels of like understanding structure in the first mm -hmm. place. And like, what are, what, like walk me through like kind of this journey of like, maybe like you're getting better, but there's still stuff maybe that's so, going on with your stories like how does that progress for you or how did that progress for you for me the reason that i'm good at structure now is that i started out actually terribly bad at it mm. usually people can't help you with things that they do naturally well like i couldn't tell you how to write dialogue i have nothing mm. but structure i was really not good at it and so and structure is really hard for readers to diagnose and so i would write books and people would tell me it's too slow and I, mm -hmm. I didn't know how to fix it. Um, and so then I had sort of this light bulb moment for that when I read Save the Cat. Um, and Save the Cat, the book in general, I thought was only okay, but there's this section right in the center called The Beat Sheet. And yeah. I read that and I was like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And I actually have a whole lecture that I do on how to take Save the Cat and use it to diagnose for revision instead mm. of for, um, but the sort of the Cliff's Notes version is depending on where your problem is, you'll hear different feedback from your reader. No one will tell you you're missing a first act break unless they themselves are an expert in structure. But what you'll hear is this story doesn't feel like it's going anywhere. It feels super episodic. You start hearing these things and you know, I have a first act problem. My mm. act break is not working. You start to be able to like want to, because yeah, she was the one that introduced me to the beat sheet. And now like, I feel like, oh, now I mm -hmm. understand structure. This is, yeah. uh, you know, and yeah, it's really, it's, it's much easier to diagnose once you actually like, you hear these things that made no sense before yeah. <laughs> or you couldn't and figure it out. Did, and, did either of you like have like a feeling of aversion to the idea of a beat sheet? I think I was so desperate to find the problem at that point that I didn't care. I was willing to listen to anything if it helped. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, and me too. And that's like I said, I, I found it through her. And she was the one that essentially, like, all of a sudden, like, really hit the nail on the head with what was wrong with my book. And so I was like, okay, give me your magical means to solve <laughs> this problem. One of the places I get a lot of pushback, though, when I lecture about it is people want the creative process to just be free. And yeah. I think that's totally fine. But then if you're making a commercial product that you want to be consumed, if you're sort of this person that needs all the room in the world to maneuver on your first draft, that's fine. But then you can still take that beat sheet and bring it to your revision and say, do I have an act break? Do I have a midpoint? Are the bad guys closing in? Is my B story solving my A story? And diagnose and revise that way. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of have the best of both worlds. Right. Right. And I imagine this, you know, has varying levels of difficulty to stick with depending on the type of story you're telling right and the genre the beat sheet yeah like if, like if you're doing epic fantasy and you've got like a, a huge cast of main characters right like so when i first encountered this i wanted to use it to revise one of my books and it was a, a thriller a science fiction thriller mm -hmm. so i went and i watched a whole bunch of thriller movies and went through and like looked at books and I just diagrammed a whole bunch of stories to help get it in my head. Yeah. And what I found was actually, it does not matter. Movies like Memento follow the beat sheet, totally yeah. out of order, things with tons of characters. What you'll have is you still have an event that is your midpoint. Yeah. You still have an event that is your act break. Like actually the more weird your story is, the more closely it needs to follow the beat sheet. Mm. Because so that it makes any sense. So that your readers can follow you. <laughs> Well, well, but also with things like epic fantasy, you're going to have like more individual arcs, mm -hmm. right? To work through, you're going to have more characters that, you know, need their own arc, more intersecting things, but it really is 
But you don't have a midpoint for everyone. Exactly. No, it's, it's for the book. And so it's yeah. really, it, it, it really is kind of fascinating to me how that works out. Cause I was really dubious about the epic fantasy in particular, yeah. but yeah, no, we, we looked at this epic fantasy, plotted it out on there. Oh yeah. Okay. No, this is what we're missing right there. Boom. Well, that's, that's great that you got in and, and, and did that exercise with things that you enjoyed. I think that probably helps. And now you've got you you're doing all these projects and you've got a track record behind you each of you like how do you know i imagine there's a certain level of like ideas get easier right to come up with and maybe there's more ideas than time <laughs> so how do you start to like triage and and cope or deal with that like or know what's a good idea and what to write next in that whole journey i think you're <laughs> You're laughing. I think you get. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think our generally our thing is I think if we like the idea, we seem to just make the time to do it. Yeah. Which is why we have like mm. a million books. <laughs> our contemporary romance series is called The X Files. It's going to be about forty-five books long. Mm -hmm. We have book. 11 coming out next yeah yeah book yeah. 11 is coming out next um we're putting one out roughly every other month mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um yeah no because we just keep coming up with ideas and we love them mm -hmm. and so we decided well we'll just throw together another one so it's it's this incredibly well-oiled machine that runs on really um like spreadsheets mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and one note and one note and mm -hmm. us just having to talk and hang out all the time mm -hmm. to, to make it work so yeah. <laughs> Well, and I like that, right? Like, if you like the idea, you find the time to write it. I guess that's a pretty good way to triage. Right? <laughs> and not, obviously not that, I mean, like, we brainstorm ideas back and forth, and not every idea has the same value, right? Like, it's not right. like we don't have ideas that we then discard because it doesn't work for the story or whatever. Mm -hmm. But usually as, like, a conceptual thing, if we love the concept of this book or we love the concept of this character or something, like so much, then we'll build something around it. Well, we have lists of character ideas and because the, the series that we're working on is all set in the entertainment industry. So we okay. have a whole list of all these different areas of the entertainment industry in which we could set books. And we have a list of all these different romance tropes we'd like to write. And we're just sort of waiting for the right trope to attach itself to the right venue and everything to sort of come together. And then we know we have a book. Mm. Mm. And so this is what the romance series and what's that yeah. called? Mm -hmm. Is this the, the extra? extra series? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. And is that a play on the show extra too? Well, it's actually, yeah. I mean, like, so it's, so it's a, the first book is a girl who um, gets a job as an extra on a soap opera set. Ah, yeah, yeah. It's um, concept. So it's the same kind of concept. And yeah, like basically she's like a regular extra. So she keeps showing up for this soap opera and it's like the drama on the soap opera, this crazy, you know, drama sort of. She's in love with one of the writers. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah. So then we have, we just take these different, you know, we'll do like a book about like rock band stuff mm -hmm. or, or for instance, we are just now um, finishing writing a book that's um, sort of based on the bachelor. Yeah. So like, yeah, it's about a contestant that falls in love. Right. <laughs> Rather than you, the you're self publishing these. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And so like you're basically hybrid authors then. So how do you mm -hmm. know, how do you know when, what you're writing should be self-published versus something you take a traditional route. So what we do is we write a first book and we give it to our agent mm -hmm. um, and he sends stuff out in New York. And if it sells, they can have it. And if it doesn't, then mm. we do all the sequels ourselves because you can't really sell second books. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. The, the advantage for us of doing the self-publishing is it like, because we have so many of these, we want to put them out quickly and regularly mm -hmm. that helps us be able to do so we're not bound to anything yeah you know? we've we, we just put out our 10th book in this series and we've been doing it for less than a year and a half and yeah, no publisher is going to keep up with that so which is pretty amazing yeah and and did you have to do a lot of work to kind of get informed about like how to do this whole self-publishing thing i imagine there's a lot of moving parts there that you don't have to deal with mm -hmm. otherwise so many moving so parts many. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I had already self-published uh, about eight books before we started. And so those I kind of think of as like my experiments is I <laughs> learned a ton about what to do and what not to do. And then when we went to do this, we made a business plan that was pretty solid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. And we, and we like went to like take courses on marketing mm -hmm. and ads and, you know, like also trying to, you know, try this, try that, different different strategies and kind of narrowing down what works. And we're still, I'm part of a lot of Facebook groups and I think 
a lot of webinars about just what's going on because the especially in indie publishing the market is constantly shifting yeah. and so you kind of have to stay up on it and see what people are doing and what's working and just try it and be willing to lose a little mm. money so that, finding that, out if that's going to work for you that is such a like a next level thing to go from like it's the first that first step right of like i'm going to write a novel and finish yeah. a novel to <laughs> I'm going to write a whole bunch of novels and I'm going to own my marketing and finding an audience and getting book covers and audiobook. Like, how did you like, was there a process of turning the corner of like taking ownership of that? Taking ownership of that. I think for me, I feel like I'm talking too much. No, you, talk you, you go ahead. Um, I think Everybody's I, allowed to talk as much as you want. I had, um, for a long time, I was only willing to look at traditional. Mm -hmm. And my agent had sent out, we, I sold a book in New York back in 2010. It came out in 2012. And the publisher sort of abandoned it before it even came out um, mm -hmm. because it didn't get into Barnes and Noble. I don't know if your uh, listeners know that just because a book comes out from a big, I was with Macmillan, I was a big New York publisher. Mm -hmm. And they, Barnes and Noble has is the one who decides what ends up on their shelves. So if a publisher tells you they can guarantee you getting into the bookstore, they're lying to you. Mm -hmm. Um, they can't. And so, and then a lot of publishers, when books don't get into Barnes and Noble, they sort of just drop them and do nothing. So that's what mm -hmm. happened to me. And so then my agent sent out three or four, maybe a few more, a lot of books, um, and they all got rejected. And so what I was looking at was this just total creative, like, vacuum of misery where I mm -hmm. felt like anything I wrote was just going to get rejected and sit there and I had no way to move forward. And it was really frustrating for me. And so basically I was at a creative place where I couldn't do it anymore. Yeah. So for me, it was either quit or figure out the indie publishing thing. And so mm -hmm. I kind of hit this rock bottom and was like, Hey, I'm going to figure this out now. And that was what gave me that willingness to do that. That's great. Yeah. I had a, I'm not going to say similar thing because she had like a longer career before I, I did, but like I had a similar thing. I was like totally, um, all for, no, I need to do traditional. Like this is, this is what I had in my head of what, you know, I wanted my career to be. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was having some success with the short stories. Um, but again, like the, you know, moving into books and, and full length novels and stuff like that. And I was just getting so, uh, just unhappy mm -hmm. <laughs> with it. Um, and, I, I knew that at a certain point, I mean, I wasn't even doing it that long, but I was just getting so like, it was miserable. And, yeah. um, and I, anyway, at one point, actually I sat down with Jancy and a, a couple other friends. And I remember being like, I'm either going to quit or I'm going to do this wholeheartedly. And so we sat down and this is what a geek I am. We made like pro and con lists of like, <laughs> what, what is pro in my life? If I, if I continue, what is, what is pro in my life? If I quit and pros and cons of what I liked about the writing, what I didn't, and you know, this and this and this. And ultimately the end of that was, ah, oh, crap, I'm going to be doing this anyway. I'm going to be miserable if I don't do this. <laughs> so like, why not? Let's just throw myself into it. And so it's not that I didn't continue to want traditional publishing, but then it was like, suddenly my mind was more open to what different avenues I could take. And Jancy already having done so much of this um, and, and been able to do this and, and, and learned all these skills, you know, then working together with her, it became, I mean, really easy for me yeah. to make that choice. Um, well, and I'm, so. I'm guessing when you made the choice, it wasn't just like you snap your fingers and success, oh. right? Oh no. <laughs> no way, no. For me, I had So tell me tell me reasons why you could have quit along the way. <laughs> like like <laughs> what has like come better. tell me about tell me about failing and and, and oh, uh, I've been talking about that all day long. Yeah, like <laughs> like how is it an instant process or you know or so we... after I made that decision to self publish, hmm. I uh I put out a, a couple of books. Um and I, the, one of the things is it's really, I want to say impossible. Maybe someone is doing it. It is next to impossible to make money on standalones yeah. in indie publishing. It's almost not a thing. Maybe if yeah. you write a lot of standalones that are all in the same genre that are basically a series, you're just not calling them a series, but you can't make money on one book. Um, and so I put out a, a lot of standalones because that's what I had written. And those were the things that had gotten rejected. And I'm glad that I did it, but those mm -hmm. books don't make any money. Um, so then I, like I said, I send books out in New York first. And so I had this book that, um, my agent said was the most commercial book I'd ever written. He was really excited about it. Um, I 
called up my friend Brandon on the phone and said, hey, I need help. And he said, okay. And he got me cover quotes from him and James Dashner and Robison Wells and Dan Wells and April and Pike. And my agent is the one who sold Brandon's book, Steelheart. And Mm -hmm. they sent it out the week that Steelheart hit like number one on the New York Times. And we had all of this buzz and the book didn't sell. (laughs) (laughs) That is true. Nothing is guaranteed. Oh my God. Okay. (laughs) I don't even like... I wanted to quit. Like you start to feel like, and that was actually, that was the moment where I was like, okay, if that didn't make New York publishers happy, nothing I do can make them happy. And so I just need to figure out how to be happy myself mm-hmm. with my That's own work and yeah. reach an audience. And so like, I feel like when you hit those moments, you have a choice, like either you give up or you let it like galvanize you to like, no, this is what I'm doing. Nobody gets to tell me to quit. I'm going right. to find another way. So was this your break into two or your break into three? Yeah. Oh my gosh, two, I think. (laughs) (laughs) And it's not like we're not still like, like trying to get into traditional stuff. Like every time we write a book, again, we send it to our agent. Mm -hmm. He he shops it around. Basically what we do is we give about a year. Yeah. Because we figure like by that point, you know, by that point, we want it back and we're going to just do it ourselves. Mm-hmm. Again, we have this. But he machine. needs that long. But he because... needs that long to, to get it out there and get it through. And also, the nice thing is there's other rights, too. And so, like, we've mm-hmm. been able to sell our audio rights traditionally mm-hmm. um, and, and have audiobooks made and stuff like Which that. Even awesome. if we're self- Oh, my gosh. It's so nice. Because it's our startup money to pay for ads. And <laughs> that's, that's great. I've, I've thought about that myself. You know, they're, you're very creative and resourceful. And it sounds like you you've done it enough that maybe you have more realistic expectations about how the process works. <laughs> yeah. It, it took a lot of <laughs> butting our heads against the wall to, yeah. to get to that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, no, I'd say our expectations are pretty realistic now. Yeah. Low. <laughs> our expectations are very low. <laughs> Which means I guess to say this is, I think this is important too. We talk about this a lot. Like we really celebrate every success. Like mm-hmm. if it's, just this little thing or whatever, but it's a success. Mm-hmm. We go out and get Indian food and like make it, you know, or go out to dinner, grab something, you know, not so much anymore. Pandemic. Mm. But like we'll um we could take out. We could take out. We'll just do it like, yay, we did this thing. And you just got to because there's so much mm. that is negative in this, you know. And nothing ever feels like a success at the moment it happens. Like when mm. your book comes out, you've been thinking about that for so mm-hmm. long. It doesn't feel like yay something happened it feels like an ending yeah yes. so you gotta yeah. celebrate anyway <laughs> that that's very wise <laughs> yeah it's a good reason to keep writing though you know mm-hmm. yeah maybe eventually it will catch up and the realizations will catch up right plus it's not like there aren't amazing things right oh, like, yeah. yeah every time we get a new book out and like i'm a i'm a big paperback reader and so like just holding those books in my hands mm-hmm. right and i you know and seeing them on the shelves and there's just you know talking to fans like i'm like oh these are actual fans who who don't know me already mm-hmm. <laughs> who are mm. friends and family you know um it's it's really cool and so you have those things to buoy you up it's just you know you really got to celebrate those things yeah <laughs> yeah and so it sounds like this process overall is still fun for you and you're having fun that's what i'm getting i don't want to put words in your mouth to but. me that comes from the collaboration yeah. yeah, I was much one of the reasons I mostly write collaboratively now is because I am so much happier because mm. there's this influx of energy and mm. synergy yeah. that makes it fun again. Yeah, yeah, for for me too. Like I, you know, like obviously I've been writing things before, but there's something about having someone who is equally invested in your book mm-hmm. and characters and things like that. Like it's one thing to talk to your friends and family and be like, Oh, and you know, I'm going this direction with this character or whatever. Um, but they don't really, care. they don't really care. Like they, <laughs> they may be interested, but they're not the ones that have these people in their heads all the time. Right. But when you're collaborating with somebody, um, they have the same interest in this as you do. So, I mean, we're always talking about our characters, texting mm-hmm. back and forth with little ideas or, you know, things like that. And it's just, it, that makes it awesome. Yeah. And did I hear, did I hear on writing excuses podcast, do you talking about, um, your planning process? Yes, you yes. probably did. <laughs> yes. Do you want to talk about that? <laughs> Okay. All right. So, (laughs) so, um, I have been essentially, I've been into Barbie since I was a little kid. Mm. Um, and, and my friend Lauren, actually the one who, um, also writes the, um, epic fantasy with us. 
we were playing Barbies long past when most people would consider it cool to play Barbies. <laughs> um, like, yeah, actually, we're 38. Like, <laughs> you're making it cool again. Right? You're bringing Barbie back. Actually, for a time, Lauren and I switched to like the little like D&D minifigures because uh-huh. we thought, well, that's like respectable because like people play the like D&D, but we weren't playing D&D. We were playing Barbies with the you little know, figures. Your hobby is out there when you switch to D&D minis <laughs> to make it more mainstream. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and we were like hardcore keeping this hidden from people uh-huh. because of the fear of judgment. But like planning out that epic fantasy series that now we're out working on that was done through this process Mm. um and then and we just did this in on and off lauren and i have always lived in different states and so like just a couple times a year whatever we get together and do this um but then at one point um then we switched back to barbies because we were both ultimately more into barbies and we just figured you know whatever we're adults now Mm -hmm. (laughs) we can afford to buy barbies and do this the way we want to um and then when i met jancy she was into like 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 the Iron Kingdoms and stuff like role playing yeah. stuff. My husband mm-hmm. paints gaming miniatures for a Okay. Yeah. So I knew she had this like sort of awesomely geeky side to her, but like I was still really I wasn't telling anyone about this. So I was still really scared to tell her like, <laughs> oh, by the way, I play Barbies like on the regular, you know? Mm-hmm. So first I started telling her, oh, I collect dolls. Like mm-hmm. I collect Barbies. She only admitted that by the way, because there was a lottery at the Disney store <laughs> for the right to buy a doll and she needed more people to come enter her lottery so that she might have the right to buy it. And so I hear this, so would you come with me to the Disney store? I need to buy this doll. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so, so then. I mean, this is trust building, right? Yeah, yeah. it was. It was. It was. Um, so, Giancy was super cool on that. <laughs> yeah. And then, I think then we worked up to, I would really like to build this, like, diorama thing. And mm-hmm. your husband and you, you guys do all this, like, artistic work with the minifigures and stuff. And, like, how would I go about doing that, you know, mm-hmm. if I were to want to do that? You know, like, that kind of a thing. So, they helped me make this, like, outdoor... I have a friend who wants to. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. 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 Um, and so we built this really outdoor, like scenic thing. And then I'm trying to remember, I don't remember exactly when I told you we play with them. Was it with the I think, I think next was, oh, and we have all these dolls of our characters. <laughs> and then I think we got to, yeah, we role play with these dolls and that's where the stories come from. <laughs> and there's no dice or, or no. like DM or anything like this. Our is process, just, a- just to be clear, our process is we take the dolls, we set them up in a little scene. The scenes uh-huh. have gotten more elaborate over the years as Megan has built all these gorgeous dioramas. Um, we set them up in a scene and then one of us is one character, one of us is the other character and we just talk. It's kind of like improv. We don't yeah. like move them around much unless somebody like goes and like does like moves to another part of the room or something we don't touch them really hardly at all yeah we just sit there and we have the conversation so it works best for dialogue it doesn't work well for action at all right yeah we almost never use it right. for like any kind of action heavy plot mm. scene it's like yeah. usually just it's fleshing out the characters actually yeah. a lot so just figuring out who the characters are and how they relate mm-hmm. to and each other or yeah. Exactly. yeah yeah and we it's it's really interesting it's like within this sort of improv um, role playing setting, we find out so much about mm-hmm. the characters, and it really, I think, helps the depth of them. You know, mm. like really come out. Do you have any examples, out. like maybe fresh on the brain, oh, something okay. you've discovered? Something we've discovered. I mean, there's been. I mean, I would say almost every book that happens, we so we plot out a general outline. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, we're basically we're like, okay, this is this is the again the romance trope. This is again the the entertainment industry thing, and we know the characters. We've come up with the characters. We have some ideas of how this is going to go, and mm-hmm. so that we know like in general what scenes we're going to do and stuff. We kind of write out like a real basic outline. Mm-hmm. Almost every book once we get into the characters, this outline, it goes off the rails. Mm-hmm. And usually the way it goes off the rails, because when we're doing romance, usually at some point in our, in our outline, we're like, and then they'll break up. And then we game the scene where they're supposed to break up, and instead they talk out all their problems. <laughs> and we're like, no! <laughs> well, that didn't work. <laughs> and some of the books, we regame the scenes and figure out, like, okay, if he doesn't say this, if she doesn't say this, this is how we're going to break them up. And sometimes we just let them stay together and figure out what our conflict is. And we actually get a mm. lot of comments that mm. our books, the conflict at the very beginning seems like it's going to be the conflict for the entire book, but it gets resolved very quickly. And the book actually turns out to be about something else. And mm-hmm. a lot of readers like that because it's less predictable. And that's where that comes from. Is yeah. We had a concept and then our characters had other ideas. In particular, I think a, a big a common thing is it's like the whole, the whole book is a lot of times in these books are based on characters just not talking to each other mm-hmm. like they're not telling each other this important thing and so that's the conflict that goes like right. generally throughout a lot of a lot of other books um that are in this genre um and 
but, but when we do this, our characters, they generally tell each other the thing. Mm-hmm. And so we're like, even though that's almost always our like plan for, for whatever reason, we're like, oh, they're just going to keep this information from each other. They but don't. They don't. <laughs> they're not, you know, like, and so we just generally let them go. And it's not that we don't herd them back in sometimes. Because we still need a book. We still need to conform them. So it's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Do you so, ever, do you ever like think about like, like maybe explicitly bucking a trope, like saying, I'm not going to do this because, you know, maybe I don't believe this, or maybe I feel this is harmful, you know, oh, yeah. to, oh, yeah. to readers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That for sure. Yeah, those, that, for... that sounds like a scary choice to make that choice, right? On the one hand, if you're trying to sell a book and land yeah, an we, audience. We like to do little twists. Like the second book in that series is called The Girlfriend Stage. And it's essentially Sweet Home Alabama. She's a soap opera actress and she goes home for a reunion. And there's, you know, the boy at home that, and uh, we decided that actually it's not him that she's supposed to be with. It's the like slick Hollywood city agent boy. dude, <laughs> city boy that she's dating. And so like, it still is the trope, mm. but it just kind of turns it. Yeah, we do a lot of that. So, like, the boy at home kind of turns out to be a big jerk, right? Yeah, <laughs> and the slick, like, city boy Hollywood agent, you know, he turns that... out to be this really <laughs> nice geek guy. <laughs> yeah. There's also there's a lot of tropes we don't do because we don't like them. Like, neither of us is a big fan. We don't do any cheating, and that's actually a pretty common thing in romance. Most romance readers don't want to read about cheating. There's, yeah. There are definitely books that are in that genre, um, and then we don't do like the sort of alpha jerk guys because we feel like those are red flags for actual abuse and this mm-hmm. isn't yeah. something we want to romanticize yeah. yeah so we we pick though and we tend to be on the same page as mm-hmm. to what tropes and what characters we like yeah um and so that helps make it easier for us to and if we do start off with like guys who are kind of jerks or have had been jerks in the past we tend to make sure they go into this book pretty humbled yeah could be or, or have humbled, a serious or, character arc or have a serious character arc where we can see that that part of them is like an actual problem and yeah. they need to become a better person like a, little redempt- <laughs> a little redemptive art yeah thing. exactly instead of just normalizing you know. right mm-hmm. or even like treating it like it's a virtue because like in yeah. the real world you don't want to date the bad guy who's a jerk to you that's not a yeah. yeah but and i'm sure you still see that in shows and books from time to time it's a really yeah. popular it's genre. actually a really popular yeah mm-hmm. and so uh, i like I imagine when you're self-publishing, it becomes a challenge and an opportunity to market or distinguish your books, right? When yeah, you're for sure. avoiding certain tropes or twisting them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think it becomes like the readers, I mean, again, we're like putting out our 11th book. The readers, I'm not going to say that like they, they know what kinds of books to, to expect. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, like I think they like that we do different things with it. So they don't know what to expect in any given book. Um, but they tend to know overall, like the kind of stories that we're telling. Um, yeah. And you don't have to please everybody. Like, oh, yeah. You just need to find an audience that is big enough to support you that likes what you're doing. And so people who love to read alpha male romance are not reading our books and no. that's okay. There are plenty of books out there for them. We just need to keep pleasing the audience that we're gaining that mm-hmm. is not looking for that, at least out of our books. Hmm. And do you, you know, I'm, I'm going to, change tracks a little bit because i've got my eyes on on the fact i took a note you do unlockable content right like like bonus scenes that like have triggers for unlocking and i'm curious about that and i guess one of the prerequisite things to mention there is i assume you have mailing lists and Uh at that point and that probably differentiates you from a lot of traditional authors the unlockable content yeah, that and having yeah. your own mailing lists and that relationship. Yeah, the mailing list in indie is it's sort of the like backbone of any marketing sort of system is you mm-hmm. want to have a mailing list so that you can get in contact with these people again so that they can find you again. Um, our unlockable content comes from, we tend to write a lot of scenes just for fun because mm. we have a reader in each other. <laughs> and it's like, I wrote this scene. You want to write the other side of the scene, well, you know? We tend to do dual POVs, right. right? So, like, one scene will be from one point of view, and it's like, uh-huh. oh, but we want to see what she has to say about this, right? Too. So then just for fun, we'll write the other one, and I was like, well, now we've got... So then we just had all this content, and we okay. were trying to figure out what to do with it, and it was actually our friend Lauren, who writes the epic fantasy with us, who said she 
I don't remember what author it was, but one of the authors that she loves does this, where it's like, when I get to this number of reviews, I'll release this scene. And we thought that was a great, it's a nice, like exciting way to release it rather than just dropping it on the blog. Yeah. And like, so how do you manage that? Does it become a big task to, to like let people know that you have this and that there's these perks? Does it like, no, we have it on the website. Like, I assume that's where you found it. We have it yeah. on the website and then we'll like send out an email with a link when it releases. And mm-hmm. like put it on our, you know, social media yeah, social stuff media. like that. But it's not like we don't do like a ton, a ton of marketing with right. each individual little It's thing. more like an Easter egg thing for people who are fans and the fans will okay. find it. And I guess that just kind of ties in with, I think it's a really cool idea, by the way. And I have to oh, think about you. stealing that in the future. Yeah, we stole it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, steal away. <laughs> but like life is busy, right? And so uh-huh. like, <laughs> <laughs> and so all, every marketing idea and, and thing you do, right, has like a tax, right? Yeah, it does. Yes. That, this is true. Yeah, we yeah. talk about like the sunk time cost mm-hmm. into things all the time and like have to balance what we think the the benefit is going to be against against really our time. Right. Which yeah. is this is this worth? I mean, obviously we both have families and things like that, but like is it worth is it is it better to do this one marketing thing or is it better to just put out another book? Mm-hmm. Um and then you have to do both. Yeah, yeah. But you like kind of sort of have to manage your time and manage it. Yeah, do you ever like decide like I'm not going to do this and I'm going to maybe not make as much money because maybe I have some other need to take care of. So we tend to prioritize anything that visibly makes money. Mm -hmm. So we're not so much giving up actual money as we're giving up potential maybe money Yeah, Mm -hmm. because there's tons of things we decide not to try because it just sounds miserable. Maybe it would make money, but we don't know. Mm -hmm. And it just is opportunity cost. It's the same with everything in life. And so we have to make, we just, we sort of, we try to prioritize things we want to do and things that we have seen be very effective in the past. And then we have an ever long list of all the things we could be doing. And right. if we get to any of those, then we're really then happy that's with our great. Space. Yeah. Well, and it's not like we haven't tried things and, and sunk mm-hmm. a lot of time into some things and, and then money. haven't, and money that haven't worked. Yeah. Right. Like that's part of the whole thing is mm-hmm. trying different stuff and seeing like, something that works really well for somebody else in their series as you know totally tanked with our series yeah. and you know like vice versa things that are working for us mm-hmm. you know don't particularly work for other people and so mm-hmm. it, it's a lot of just trying stuff and knowing knowing when to stop yeah <laughs> with that thing mm-hmm. and knowing when to just give it a little bit longer and it's wow it's it's tough yeah mm. and so balance is a big keyword I track a lot. Right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and what is what does balance mean to each of you? Oh, that's a question. <laughs> I don't know that we achieve it all, all the time. <laughs> to me, it's about priorities. Mm-hmm. Like I do online school with my kids. I did that before. It was cool. And my husband works from home and I work from home and we are all just kind of before the pandemic doing kind of what everybody else started doing at the beginning of the pandemic and decided was awful, but I Mm -hmm. like it. (laughs) This is my regular life. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's, am I getting done the things that are important to me? Are my children, do they feel happy and loved and are they being educated and are they healthy? And do I feel like I am not losing my mind? (laughs) I'm on the edge of losing my mind a lot, but like, do I feel healthy and like, I'm, I guess, balanced, like as a person Mm -hmm. and is my writing, achieving am am I accomplishing what I need to accomplish and if I'm doing those things in general I try not to worry I don't succeed but I try not to worry so much about the little things yeah I find that sometimes things like like there are times and and I it might be easier for me because my my kids are actually older so in a lot of ways they're they're definitely more like self-sufficient in their schooling and things like that um but there are times in which it's like no, mom's going to be just crazy busy for this mm-hmm. next month or so. So like, that's just, it's not that I don't like take any time to spend with them, but it's going to be less than normal. Mm-hmm. And, and they understand. And as long as I then later shift that balance and give my family that time, um, it, it, I mean, it helps if you, if you have a lot of supportive, you know, yeah. people around you who are, you know. Yeah. And that's the other thing for me is my husband works from home. He works nine to five and he does evenings and weekends with the kids. So mm-hmm. we kind of, he is supporting us because his, work actually makes money it's so funny that he he paints gaming miniatures and this has always been our bread and butter for Mm. 
Mm. the whole time we'd been married, um, which is kind of unbelievable to me. But um, (laughs) he then he takes the kids in the evenings and the weekends. So we kind of are doing this 50 50 parenting thing, Mm -hmm. which gives me a lot more time. I couldn't do it without him. Like if he, if I had to also be 24 seven mom on the weekends and in the evenings, I couldn't get half the work I done. I, mm. I get done finished. My husband's really great with that too. Mm-hmm. Like I mean, hanging out with the kids, making sure they're, you know, getting some parent time, like doing stuff around the house, that kind of thing to like free up my time to work too. Mm-hmm. So really that support is huge. I wouldn't be able to do it without it. Yeah. Yeah. And like, that sounds like you know, kind of evolving to having, boundaries and healthy boundaries yeah for sure and was was it like hard initially to ask for support or or help like when you're early on and you're like i'm excited about this writing thing and i'm gonna take it seriously and so i was already there when i got married and so i remember having this conversation with my husband and saying this is what i do i'm a writer this is not going to change like Mm. this is what i do and he was on board with that and so and sometimes in our marriage, he has been more on board with it than I am, where I'm like, I am done. I want to quit. And he's like, no, you're not. <laughs> you're not going to quit. <laughs> but he also, I, at the same time, was asking him and he was kind of like, well, I kind of want to paint minis for a living. And I think me saying, OK, let's run a minis painting business then and mm-hmm. putting my energy into helping him build that. Now it runs more or less without me. But in the beginning, I put a lot of work into that business. Um that it's this partnership that just sort of got established when we met. And so there was never any me asking for this. That's just who we are. Yeah. That's cool that you kind of inspired him to do what he wanted to do. (laughs) Yeah. He's not a like go getter. And so like he wanted it, but he wasn't going to go do it. I was the one who was like, okay, this is the, let's make a list, you know? (laughs) Uh, and Megan? Mm-hmm. Oh, I was say, so my husband has always been just like a pretty chill guy. And mm. so like, yeah, he knew I was a writer when we first got married, but I wasn't like writing a ton then. So it didn't actually like really affect, you know, much of anything, but he, he's always been supportive. The times when I've written a lot more, the times when I've written a lot less, he's just sort of, you know, cool. As long as you're doing this thing and you're feeling fulfilled and that he's just always been really supportive and like definitely willing to step up in the times when, he didn't know he was going to have to spare multiple rooms in his house for Barbie diorama. Yeah, this is true. Yeah, I know. We have multiple rooms in our house that are filled now with Barbie diorama. So that might have been a deal breaker if he had known this back <laughs> back in the day. But it's if he too can late that, now. Yeah. <laughs> if he can put up with that. He can put up with the writing. Right, exactly. Yeah, the writing's the least of his concerns. <laughs> do, do you each, do you have like maybe like these big dreams that you haven't achieved yet that maybe are driving you forward yeah (laughs) tell me i mean we have an audience i want i want to make a full-time living yeah which we don't do right now right i want to i want to have big books that everyone's heard of Mm -hmm. i want to be one of these big authors i may never get there Mm. but i want it Mm mm-hmm Yep. I'm the same way. That's exactly. I would love to be able to make like a, you know, I'm making a full-time living um, Mm -hmm. out of this and you know, feeling like I'm getting paid for the number of hours I spend doing this. (laughs) The reason that we don't is because we only started this business. We've been writing together for about six years. We started publishing together about a year and a half ago. And so we are in that stage of our business where we are having success that is costing us money. Mm -hmm. And that's anybody who runs a business knows that's normal. Like you get to this point where we need to put more money into ads because the ads are making a profit, but we like, so all of our profit has to be reinvested. Yeah. Yeah, It's cash flow stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So we are making money, but we're reinvesting a hundred percent of our money right now to like reach that point where we can start paying ourselves. So it's almost like the success is it, it feels like we're not having success because we're still not making money, but we are making oh, we money. Actually are. <laughs> it's a weird place to be. I actually, I totally, <laughs> I totally get that. And that's something like, I think that can be a surprise or for people who go into business for themselves. Mm-hmm. Right. Or, yeah. or you go into business and you're not expecting that to be the case. Right. right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you really, I mean, like, yeah, you could start the minute you start making any profit, start taking that out, but then you're not going to build your business. Right. You're not going to make the kind of profit you want to. And so, and know. for me, it was just really hard to recognize 
where I just kept looking at the data and running the numbers and be like, I think we are both succeeding and failing simultaneously. <laughs> what is happening? And be able to like sort it out and be like, oh no, we are succeeding. This is what success looks like. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Do you ever like get impatient and like, oh my gosh, I wish I could just like, you know, like have this gumball machine where I put, oh, a, yes. put a few more time. extra quarters in and, you uh-huh. know. We have to, we have to remind ourselves all the time, like mm-hmm. r- really how new it is that we have essentially started this business in the sense of putting these books out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, that like, this is very recent because we've been writing these things for, mm-hmm. you know, many, many, like six years, like you're saying. Yeah. Um, I remember Megan had this moment when we put our first book out because like we've been writing for four and a half, five years uh-huh. because we'd written all these books and then we put them out one a month for over the course of a year. We couldn't write them and put them out that fast. But, so we had them sort of stockpiled and we put out the first book and Megan was just like, I want to cry. We did all of that work and there's only one book. <laughs> Uh-huh. <laughs> like there wasn't only one book but it sure felt that it way sure felt like i was expecting this like this is you know this novel we're finally getting it out there and like we came in i just expected to feel this like moment of triumph and i was like oh that's only one book <laughs> it feels like we, we had like ever. eight yeah. books written at the time uh-huh <laughs> just... it, it kind of goes back to what i wrote down when he said yeah nothing feels like success when it happens <laughs> right it is so true. <laughs> so it sounds like that's kind of where you're at right now, right? It's like this yeah. big game of delayed gratification. Yeah. Yes. That's well, and we we have to remind ourselves constantly, like we have an audience that we have are people we have never met. Some of them live in other countries. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. None of them we, we haven't ever spoken to these people and they buy our books when they come out consistently mm. and they're yeah. working our, their way through our series and that is something we could not say a year ago and that is huge yeah it is huge. and so yeah. you have to kind of sit down with yourself and be like here are all the ways in which i am succeeding <laughs> yeah and so there's like a lot of metrics there kind of yeah. beyond beyond oh. just the hey i have six-figure income with <laughs> It tends, it tends to be nice because so, with the two of us, it tends to be that one of us is having one of those days mm-hmm. where like, oh, we're failures, this is so terrible, and the other one is able to like talk them through like, no, actually, this and this and this, and then it swaps like yeah. next month or whatever, yeah, right. so or the next day, <laughs> or the next day depending, um, so that's helpful. Yeah, just like if you're feeling down, maybe it's time to go play Barbie. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, it's so true. That happens a lot, mm-hmm. actually. <laughs> but any, even if you don't have a co-writer, it's important to have a support system. Of people who write. Yeah. Yes. People who are writers who are in the same place you are, mm-hmm. who can be like, but look, you did this awesome thing. Right. Yeah. And can point that out to you yeah. and, you know, remind you of those things. So it's really easy to forget that. Mm. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that. And I, I, I keep have doing these interviews and keep expecting to meet the mythical lone wolf who does it all themselves and <laughs> experiences nope. success in a vacuum. And I have yet to meet that person. No, no. Yeah. I haven't either. Humans aren't like that. That's what we learned from the pandemic. <laughs> we don't operate all by ourselves, even when it's in our health or like the interest of our public health. We need uh, other people. There you go. <laughs> Well, for people who want to learn more about you, how can they do that? Um, we have a couple of websites. There's uh, extraseriesbooks.com and mm-hmm. fivelandsaga.com. I also have jancypatterson.com. Mm-hmm. What's your website? Uh, megangray.com, but it's, <laughs> it hasn't been updated in forever, so learning on that one. You can um, also find us, uh, Jancy Patterson and Megan Walker, on Facebook and Instagram. Okay. And if they just look up Jancy Patterson and Megan Walker on Amazon, you'll pull up the books and uh, Kara My Witter. name is weird. And so you can find me just on Google and then you can find Megan. <laughs> very much work. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Well, yes, my name is weird too. <laughs> well, thank you, Jancy and Megan for doing this and a lot of fun. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode of the fearless storyteller. As a reminder, any and all links can be found in the show notes. And if you're enjoying this podcast, will you please consider leaving a review? By doing so, you'll be helping new listeners discover the Fearless Storyteller podcast.